I'm now going to ask if we can put on screen the emergency motion which was referenced yesterday. Uh, just to be clear, we are not now debating this motion. Um, if you want clarification about any part of it, and there'll be a moment, of course, to read it, then that is in order. Um, our purpose as a governing body is to determine whether or not we wish to receive and then later this morning debate this motion. So let me just give people a moment to take in what's on the screen. And Matthew has helpfully just added that um, we're not looking for any amendment at this stage. Um, if there is um, a mind to amend the motion, that will be when we come to debate it later this morning, should the governing body wish to do so. So are there any questions merely about the shape and form and also about the procedures? Otherwise, we will, if not, we will take a simple vote on whether or not to have this motion presented later this morning. Are there any questions? I see none. In which case, if you are prepared to receive this on the floor of the governing body later this morning, could you please show? Thank you very much. Are there any against? Are there any abstentions? No. That is passed. Thank you. We will make sure that is presented later to us this morning. Uh, Heather, I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Archbishop. Christ uh, on all, welcome back, everybody, to uh, this session of uh, governing body of Church in Wales. And I am absolutely delighted to be chairing today um, as uh, we discuss uh, this motion about climate change and uh, talk about progress to net zero carbon. Um, I shall be delighted to welcome uh, Bishop Joe, Bishop of St. David's, to propose, and Reverend Peter Ratcliffe uh, to second, and then uh, we will have um, Mr. Alex Glanville and Ms. Julia Edwards um, doing all the hard work with you as we go through it. So just to set the scene, if I may, uh, a year ago, this governing body made the uh, statement, a declaration of a climate emergency. Uh, that's the what and uh, the, the, um, what we've heard already at Governing Body in terms of taking action, not just being a talking shop, making progress. That's what we're going to be doing in this session. So today is the how. How do we progress this declaration, this commitment to uh, to, to trying to do something about climate change by progressing as a church to net zero carbon. Um, the, uh, personally, I am extremely delighted to be able to be involved in this by chairing. Uh, both my grandchildren, uh, around the age of two, from my two daughters, uh, were baptised on Holy Saturday. And so um, this brings to mind, this makes very immediate for me, uh, the, our five marks of mission and also thinking ahead to the future of what church will be there for them after us. Uh, and our, what I call our core business, we heard yesterday from Bishop Cherry, uh, it reminded us of the Anglican five marks of mission, our tell, teach, tend, transform, and of course this one, treasure treasure this wonderful world that we've been given and make sure there are vines and fig trees for all of us to sit under. 
Um, so, uh, and, and of course, it's not just the future. Our world now is affected by wildfires, by floods, by rising sea levels, and uh, our brothers and sisters around the world are directly affected by this now. So uh, I want to just uh, focus on what we will be doing as part of this debate. This is the process, and this is a process of co-production. You've been pr provided with an excellent document, which is... Uh, the, the fantastic work that's been done, which has got the plan in it. But what we need to go away with is your views of what is realistic, uh, how we get people involved, what buy-in we can get, what we can actually do to make a difference. Not forgetting that we are not Greenpeace, we are not the government, we are not CADU. Uh, what we are doing is trying to use this approach to live our values as a church uh, and that in itself can be a vehicle for evangelism. So if I could just bring to your attention, to uh, before I invite uh, Bishop Joe uh, to come and propose, consider the, the, the questions we are being asked, the key challenges, so that you are actively listening and thinking about these questions as you hear the proposal. Think about the key challenges, look at those recommendations and the action plan and say, what can we actually deliver on? Because... Uh, we are not just a talking shop. We are not a talking shop. We are here to do. We are here to live God's word. So could I uh, give an extremely big welcome uh, to uh, Bishop Joe, Bishop of St. David's, to propose the motion. And the motion is there on the screen for you. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Archbishop, Chair, members of governing body, it's a privilege to be presenting this motion this morning. The motion asked the GB to endorse this framework document, uh, including any suggestions from the group work, uh, which of course are as yet unknown. So I might be in the very, very unusual, possibly unique position of proposing a motion that isn't yet complete. Um, but the suggestions um, that will then form part of the motion that we will vote on will not have been put before us before uh, this motion is seconded. Uh, so, although it's, it's not a complete um, change of process. This motion asks the GB to endorse the framework document and then urge all parts of the Church in Wales at each and every level to fulfill the aims and objectives that have been clearly set out. And what we are wanting to do, and I quote, is to enable us to realize our net zero carbon ambitions. Governing body, we are not today in the field of aspirations or hopes or wishes. Today we are doing the work based on the incredible work of our provincial team about how to put our hopes for our planet into action in those areas in which we have responsibility. So how does this document do this? Firstly, and very, very importantly, it gives us a chance to learn from our experience along the way. This document sets out a trajectory for all parts of the Church in Wales until 2030. So obviously any document written now is not necessarily going to be as relevant in 2028. And so uh, the chase group of the Church in Wales, and I call your attention to page 30 of this document, uh, where it points out that this net carbon framework is a working document. And as such, the recommendations and action points contained in this document will be regularly renewed. And the Chase Group of the Church in Wales has been tasked with receiving those uh, points that are made and to keep updating this framework document so that it doesn't sit on a shelf as the thing we passed 
this year, but is always being renewed to be a document that at each point in our journey towards net zero will give us the help, support, guidance that we need for whenever it is today. By passing this motion, we shall be presenting ourselves with a means of holding ourselves accountable as well as a means of how we do it that will enable each of the constituent parts of our province to live sustainably and therefore responsibly and incorporating developing notions of good practice as we go along. And I call you back to the inside cover because as has been pointed out by our chair, we are a community of faith and therefore our response to the climate emergency is not just rooted in the science, it's rooted in the charge that is expressed in Genesis 1 whereby human beings are given responsibility for stewardship. And so we start this framework with a prayer. And should this motion uh, be carried by this governing body, I would like to suggest that the very first thing we do after that is to pray this prayer uh, together. We are a community of faith. It starts with prayer, and I would like to turn your attention now to uh, page 15. Because again, we're not here in the realms of aspiration. Aspirations are long gone. We're here now at a time of our life when we need to do something. And in this wonderful framework document from page 15 onward, we have a broken down, time-framed set of objectives and aims and actions for each point of the church in Wales. It covers churches, church halls, and cathedrals. It covers parsonages and bishops' houses. It covers diocesan offices, diocesan boards of finance. And it covers, in that context, the buildings, the energy use, the travel to and fro, the land that we have, and all those activities that take place in all of those buildings, how can we also uh, provide a framework for those people who use those buildings to use them most appropriately? And also then, uh, at page 22, it covers St. Paddens. And then the representative body's provincial office. And then on page 27, comes down to individuals and congregations. And it encourages us, as we actually look at our own very base level in our parishes, we also take the message home and presumably learn from those other organisations within our communities that are on this same journey, and those same people uh, that are neighbours who live alongside us, who also care for the future of this planet. So this is a very practical document that is practical as it starts, but is also practical because it is possible to update it from our experience. So what I come to the recommendations, which you'll find... in the middle of the report. Can you guide me? I've lost the page number. Page 10, thank you. Page 10, the recommendations. And having set out in the introduction an overview of what the scope of the Church in Wales is, and having given us at the end of the document a step-by-step -step plan for how to practically enable us to get there, uh, this document recognises that a plan is only as good as the people who are living it out and doing it. And so the first recommendation that the RB uh, is asked to do, recommendation one on page 11, 
is that the representative body will sh be asked to offer externally delivered carbon literacy training to key church representatives. If we're going to do this, we have to know what we're doing. Uh, the time for amateurishness is past. We have a deadline for carbon net zero. And the RB is being asked by this motion to train key people so that we will be able to do this framework document properly. And key people uh, need tools. And so recommendation two, which you find on page 12, is that the representative body be asked to consider funding one energy audit per church and to scope a regularised energy audit format as guidance for use across the church in Wales. And of course, as we learn to do that with our church plant, so we can use that in the rest of our lives. So the second recommendation is about training the people. And the third recommendation that is part of this motion is that the representative body will provide access to the electronic online energy footprint tool for all churches and cathedrals to actually see what our buildings are using, how we use them, and what the cost uh, to the environment is. And as we learn to do that as a church community, again, so we can do that for our own properties and so we can do that within our community for the wider landscape into which the church in Wales fits. I don't think we should underestimate the significance of this motion today. All the outside experts are telling us that we are running out of time. This is a timely motion that has been very well prepared for us. This is not ah, pie in the sky or airy fairy. Our climate change champion, Julia, and Alex, our property manager, have presented us with the tools to do the job. Governing body, if you pass this motion, you will be committing us to action, uh, which we can do alongside our communities in Wales. But we will be showing that as a church in Wales, we actually take the creation uh, that we live in and which we know to be part of God's economy very, very seriously and our part as stewards. Uh, governing body, I urge you, uh, when the time comes, uh, to pass this motion and in the meantime, uh, to put your heads together to examine this document and to make specific suggestions about how it might be improved or changed uh, during, um, during your, your time together. Governing body, please accept this motion. And not only this motion, but to what lies behind it. Commit yourself to the work that this framework document sets ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Joe. Um, much appreciated, and uh, we hear your passion. I'm delighted to say that uh, we have the expert help of uh, Alex Glanville and Julia Edwards, who are now going to take us through uh, the action that you are now going to undertake in workshop groups. So thank you, Alex, for explaining that. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, Alex Glanville, um, your Head of Property Services at the Provincial Offices. I'm joined with our work today by Julia Edwards, your climate change champion, and we'll be steering you through this uh, piece of group work. So I'm going to do the practical arrangements for this as quickly as I can. You're going to be working in groups today, uh, really to help us polish and finally shape this framework. So we're really keen to hear your observations on what's being created. The framework has been through a number of committees in various parts of the church already, so it's not just something we've magicked from nowhere. Um, but we really hope that your contributions today will help us really fine-tune this. So you're going to work in groups. Now, groups are... Um, there are facilitators and note-takers who've been allocated, and they should have some numbers. So um, you're going to have to move around any one of those numbers. It doesn't matter where you go. So in a minute, when we, I finish this bit, if those facilitators could wave a number, you can see where your nearest table is, and make your way over there. So there are less groups than there are tables. So some of you will have to move. I don't know if you remember, I did child of the 70s. Um, you'll have five seconds to run around in a little while. So, um, all right? Um, 
So your note takers are going to record all that's discussed. And it's really important that everything you say uh, is written down. There are sheets on ta within the groups. Really important you write everything down. But we're hoping that you can come up with three key points you want to make from each group. And at the end of this, you're, we're going to run around each of the tables and you, each group will literally have two minutes, that's all. You can do a lot in two minutes uh, to give us those three points. And it won't matter if you repeat things that people already said, because if you say the same thing 12 times, I think that's a pretty clear message to us that something needs to be done. So there'll be uh, 12 groups. Groups one to four, they're going to look at the key challenges. So we've broken it down so that uh, you're not all trying to discuss everything at once. So groups one to four are going to look at the key challenges. Groups five to eight are going to look at the immediate recommendations and uh, review those for us. And groups nine to 12 will look at the action tables to see if they're useful, etc. But equally, if there are any other things that come up in those discussions from any of the groups, if there's anything significant you think's missing, please tell us and make sure that's one of your three key points. And then after, we'll do that for about half an hour, and then we'll reconvene in plenary with a roving mic to go round and hear your points. All clear? So I think the main thing is if the facilitators can show where they are and just move yourselves to if be near one of those If our facilitators could stand groups. up, maybe, Might that be would be easiest, great. Yeah. So gravitate towards whoever you like. It doesn't matter. And uh, get going. Thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Governing Body. Thank you, first of all, for the enthusiasm and buzz that's been in this room. And apologies that we're calling the discussions short, because, of course, this is a climate emergency. So we, we have to do this rather rapidly. Now, we've got two roving mics. I've got one of them. Alex has got the other. And you have two minutes per table, please, because we're trying to be on time. Two minutes per table to give your three key points. Now, I say two minutes per table because Alex has actually got a stopwatch. And he obviously looks far more menacing than I do. Well, maybe. OK. so. If we can, please, the first four groups, tables one, groups one to four, we're looking at the key challenges. So if we go to group one, please, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you. So uh, looking at the first question then, um, we think we didn't see uh, amongst the key challenges the pressure of a, an increasing portfolio of closed and redundant churches within, uh, within the church in Wales uh, and how, how that specifically uh, changes or moves the challenge um, into just into a different, in, different area of the church's life uh, but is equally there and how that's going to be covered by uh, the proposals in this, uh, uh, in this report. Uh, but also that we, we saw a lot in terms of the knowledge-related uh, stuff there about training but actually identifying that there is a kind of genuine human and people and availability issues to that. Um, having all the training available for them is potentially great, but might not actually be able to be put into people's hands if, if we can't identify uh, the right people to do it in every place. Uh, talking about rural churches, rural ministry areas with 25 churches, that's difficult for a ministry area to deliver something across 25 churches, and there might not be enough people to champion it and to um, use the training they receive across those areas. And just as a, a third extra little thing that kind of fits within this but also doesn't, um, uh, noticing that the actual proposals themselves, the first two are saying that the RB should be asked, and the third is that the RB will, just wanting the reassurance that the RB will if we pass the motions. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, group two. Uh, Susan, do you want to pass that to me? Thanks. Um, so our first challenge would be to ensure that a, a clear theological perspective is given for this so we have a pattern of life and it becomes part of our way of pattern of life. So there needs to be some teaching 
as part of the, one of the challenges that's given. Secondly, we're concerned that the technology will change far, fairly rapidly uh, as um, uh, lots of people move towards carbon neutral. So one of the challenges is not to buy into technology too early because you might find that it's out of date and will be better coming along the line. So it was a challenge of 2030 is the date, but actually is that right and is that forcing us to do things too quickly when we might do better with a bit longer? Understand the reason for 2030, but let's just make sure that we don't hook ourselves onto something just for the sake of it. And thirdly, how to incentivize people. We think there's a huge challenge of how you incentivize people at a local level to take part in this. So, for example, you know, could we be incentivized, the local parishes, MACs, get your parish share reduced if you undertake a lot of carbon neutral stuff? That's my bid straight away for a reduction in parish. We think that's good, don't we? Yeah. So those are our three. Alex, for you. Thank you very much. Group three, please. Uh, Boridar, good morning. Uh, I'm not, uh, as you know, uh, used to talking a lot in front of you, so I'll, I'll try and keep <laughs> this quick. Um, we came down to three key points. The first was, I'm afraid, finance. You look at the list of actions that are set out here, and there simply isn't the money available to, to meet them all in the timescale we're looking at. We need to think, you know, what it is we're trying to do, and... Yeah, we would talk about picking up the low-hanging fruit. Well, even with low-hanging fruit, you need to pay the pickers. And you know, we need to think quite carefully about how we're going to finance this in the long run. There was a strong feeling that we needed um, a sort of central national Wales guide to how we take this forward. Yes, this is a, a useful start, but the practicalities, um, it was referred to as an idiot's guide. I think they were just talking about me at the time. Um, but you know, this, how do you buy the, the most eco-friendly um, energy? How do you make sure that it's not actually being uh, you know, come off the equivalent of the back of a truck from Gazprom? And you know, that, that sort of information has to, be, has to be shared and has to be usable. The third one was when we were asked if anything is missing, um, I looked at this and said people. And defined that in terms of emotional intelligence, lobbying, uh, relationships with local communities and whatever. None of this will work if we don't either meet the, you know, sort of the theological needs of some or the regulatory needs of others or the financial needs of, of many. And those will involve individual discussions, corporate discussions, lobbying, a whole range of relationships between people that is the only way this, this can work. Um, we did talk about you know, a long and slow process. This can't be a long process or a slow one. We have eight years on this. Um, and you know, we need to have the right people doing the right things in the, in the right times. Thank you. Now group four, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we began with motivation, the challenge of uh, engaging and enthusing uh, our churches at a local level. Uh, this is fantastic and a lot of detail, but actually something much more basic than that, a little bit around theological vision um, and, uh, and incentivization. Uh, second thing was around uh, finances. Uh, again, this is very much from a, looking at it from the perspective of a local church. Uh, so you have cost of living increasing dramatically at the moment. We have the challenge of congregational giving. Um, and then at the other end of that, you've got a more complex and demanding uh, funding framework. And actually, how can the church um, centrally support local congregations in their uh, fundraising and in their culture of giving seem to be enormously important. Uh, and then thirdly, uh, buildings uh, for us, the question was, um, is it really possible to hit carbon uh, net zero with the buildings that we have? And given the, uh, the heritage framework that there is and the constraints on what we can do with our buildings, um, you know, how can we put pressure on CADU and other organizations like that to say, look, we need to take this increasingly seriously. And one question that came out of that was, we noticed that schools weren't included uh, in, um, in the paper and just wondered why that was. Thank you very much. 
um, and I've moved over here now. Um, we've covered groups one to four. Um, those were the key challenges. We're now moving on groups five to eight, which are um, engaged in looking at the immediate recommendations. So I'm group five, please. Thank you. Thank you. So in the time that we had available, we focused on recommendations one and two. Um, the first point that we wanted to make was that we thought it might be necessary to look again at the list of people who are currently in line to receive training. Um, we think that the sort of who and the how of the training needs some further thought, particularly distinguishing between those who have influencer roles and those who have implementer roles. Um, and we, ha we had some interesting discussions, but I think the takeaway is that it probably requires more thought. The second point we wanted to make was around the timing of the training, and it was pointed out that it can feel quite overwhelming when we are presenting people purely with the, the scale of the problem without a sense of solution. And given the timelines that we're offering for audits, we may, not, we, we may want to wait until we've got some solutions um, but before delivering that training so that people go away empowered with a sense of what they can do. And the final point that we wanted to share uh, was again actually related to the audits. Um, it, it is a huge undertaking to audit all buildings, and many of our buildings are quite similar. Uh, so one of the things that we were interested in was early on producing exemplar audits of um, almost different models of church. So, you know, you have one for the sort of 1970s brick build, one for the 1500s, uh, uh, you know, so that actually people, even before their own church may have been considered in depth, can have a look at a church like theirs. Um, and, and if those exemplars could con could show both what some of the challenges are, but also what solutions could be appropriate and potential costs for some of those solutions, um, that could be really supportive. And there was a suggestion that it may work then in the long run to tie the audits in with the quinquennials um, so that we're killing two birds with one stone. Thank you. Thank you. And now to group six, please. Thank you. Um, so one of the things which we'd like to see in the recommendation uh, is some guidance on who it is we need to badger uh, in order to be able to put into practice uh, what we can actually do. Okay, so we think there is a conflict between what we'd like to do and what we actually can do. So who do we need to badger? Who do we need to talk to? Government, CADU, DAC, et cetera, et cetera. So we'd like some guidance on that. We also thought um, that we would like to encourage churches locally to search out partners uh, who would enrich the conversation, so local schools, we've got a local Greenpeace, other people who are really interested in this, because we can all um, reflect ideas backwards and, and forwards, but we did think that churches need to be seen to be taking a lead, so not go out straight away, but actually take the lead and then go out to partners. And the third point is we would like to see um, a recommendation that net zero needs to be a standing item on every church community. So not ministry, area, well, could be ministry area level as well, but it needs to be really church level um, so that people can be enthused at that and, and can take ownership of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Now we move on to group seven. Thank you. Um, hi, uh, we, our first uh, point was, it was again about the delivering of training and we thought it very important to deliver training to those who will be doing the work, which was the point made over there, uh, get buy-in at grassroots level, um, the archdeacons are crucial in identifying the easy wins which will help uh, ministry area leaders actually get going on the process and get congregations aware that this is something they can actually achieve. So again, we, we weren't sure about doing it top-down training. We thought, why not just go straight out there to the people who'd actually be doing the work. Um, two proposals, could the church in Wales negotiate uh, block energy contracts that churches could buy into, um, as is done for insurance? Uh, the second proposal, how about encouraging suitable churches to go off-grid altogether? 
some, some small medieval churches are already off-grid. I've got one of them. Um, but that's surely a, a possible thing to do, um, maybe where electricity needs renewing, to say, do we actually need this, or could this become uh, lit, this building, another way? Thank you. Thank you. Trust me, this won't take two minutes. <laughs> right, the first uh, recommendation we looked at was the... The, the first recommendation that we um, looked at was the training. And we need to include the clergy and the lay chairs, not just be management-led for training. Um, we need to invest in people who have an interest and who can encourage others. And don't drip, d drip down the information. We need to flood it down so that everyone can get involved and know what we're doing with co-production. The second one is, um, what is the, le uh, the mechanism of the audits and how will the recommendations be paid for and how can an, an enthusiastic parish volunteer to have an inspection before the next quinquen quinquennial? And finally, um, with the um, energy footprint, how will people get access to this tool if they are not advanced with technology, as some people are still computer illiterate? The energy footprint tool sounds useful. Let's hope it is. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and that actually concludes the fourth groups, the um, groups four to eight. Now we take groups 9 to 12, and we're looking at the action tables themselves, please. So group 9, thank you. Uh, good morning. So we have considered the, the usefulness or otherwise of the action tables. Um, and we've reflected on the actions themselves and the timescales that have been set out. And I think uh, our three suggestions uh, would, would be thus. First of all, uh, we think that EV charging is a quick win for the church in Wales. Uh, we think that it is an outward facing, practical, useful uh, commodity uh, for uh, our parishioners, but also for tourists who are visiting rural Wales. Um, but we know that it will be beyond our scope as individual churches. So uh, we like the urgency of the 2023 suggested timescale, uh, but we consider that there needs to be a lot more thought around grants, uh, partnerships with local and national government, uh, suggestions of companies with whom we can engage to make that happen. Uh, so I think probably our position uh, on this is that it would confer a great advantage, uh, but it will need guidance from the top. This has to be a provincially managed strategy uh, as we roll it out through Wales. We also uh, want to be more ambitious in the timescales for energy audits. We think that by doing this uh, with a commercially attractive contract, uh, again, led provincially, uh, we could do more um, before 2026. And that actually a lot of ministry areas, a lot of parishes would need that energy audit to create the sense of drive and urgency uh, to bring about positive change. And then our last uh, contribution is what we think is missing from the tables. And that's something to do with liturgy and preaching uh, and it's implicit, for example, in the Eco Church Awards, uh, but we think it should be explicit. And we'd also like to see more around partnerships, local community, local councils. Um, and I think that there's probably something more uh, that, that could feature in those tables around those issues. Thank you. And now on to group 10, please. Yeah. We, um, well, we started by talking about sewage, which is a particular passion of some members of our group. Uh, we were delighted to see there were some points about uh, blockages for gutters and that sort of thing, but we wondered whether um, we could look at um, transitioning from septic tanks in more rural contexts. The second thing we looked at was implementation 
and how this would be led. We don't want to add another burden to local uh, PCCs. We acknowledge and appreciate the point around diocesan climate change champions. I think there was a question, maybe that could be encouraged at a, a local parish level as well. And um, we noted the, as has already been said by Bishop Joe before, the, uh, the evangelistic potential of, um, of seeing this as part of our mission and reaching out to local communities through it. And lastly, we talked about the Eco Church um, initiative and the partnership with Arosha and a couple of questions around the, the applicability of the Eco Church framework in ministry areas, uh, multi building um, church groupings where the Eco Church uh, initiative seems to have been designed for single uh, building churches. Um, and also questions around the, the, uh, the, the nature of that partnership, um, how that could be set up in such a way that, it, that it's effective without imposing anything on churches where, where aspects aren't, aren't applicable. Thank you, thank you very much. And now moving on to group 11, please. We, we looked at um, the willingness of uh, people outside this room to, to actually achieve these timescales and linked with that is what pace of change are we or our, our congregations uh, actually willing to accept? Um, you know, is, do we have a feel for that? Because without them, it's not going to happen. Um, and, and linked to that, we looked at um, identifying quick wins, things that have already been mentioned, like smart meters, um, LED light bulbs, um, EV charging, which might not be such a quick win, depending on where you live. Um, and that could then be used to, to, to energize people and say, actually, not all of this is really difficult. And I think also linked to that um, in, in making these achievable, we had a, quite a conversation about young people. They've already been mentioned. We had a young lady on the Monmouth video yesterday talking about climate change. And we know that our young people are really energized about this. You know, they, they are much better at knowing about climate change than we are, but we're not giving them a voice. Um, they're not here speaking. We have young people in the room. We had young people in the room yesterday, but are we allowing them to talk? Um, they have ideas and they have energy. Um, they should be leading us, um, but we're not actually allowing them to do that. Thank you very much. And now to group 12, please. Um, we uh, have said quite a lot of what other people have said with the questions we were raised when we we're looking at these grids is who is responsible for each thing there was some confusion over um, uh, who was going to take on ultimate responsibility and typically who is paying for it uh, which is always uh, what churches love to talk about uh, who pays for it and we also quite a, a long discussion about there's a lot of work here about making buildings energy efficient and changing buildings, whereas actually uh, we felt that the elephant always in the room is getting rid of a lot of the buildings. Uh, and it seems um, that uh, a radical, robust rationalization of our building stock uh, would be better to then invest in those that can be made uh, eco-friendly. They were the points that we made. Well, thank you. There were 12 groups, 12 full, very, very full responses, and we very much appreciate the efforts that have gone into that. And I feel that we could have gone on and on, actually. But thank you. They've been very, very helpful. Also, at the end of this, the sheets and everything that has been written down, we will take away and inform us as we review this framework. And I, you know, we look to your enthusiasm in continuing this because it is literally the start. And as you have highlighted, there are things to add, things to implement. So thank you very much with that. Thank you. And if I may pass back to the...
Mr Chair, please. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Alex and Julia. Um, fantastic. And I think that actually is an example of how we should spend our time well in communicating with each other and really identifying the problems, solving, um, getting solutions, and then uh, looking for ways to implement. So uh, we've had a very full discussion at our tables. Could I now invite uh, the Reverend Peter Ratcliffe to second the proposal, please? It's Dan Priddy is seconding. Oh, I'm so sorry. It's Dan Priddy. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, and welcome. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Dan Priddy, uh, St. David's Diocese, so not the Reverend Peter Ratcliffe, uh, not ordained. Uh, so, Chair, Governing Body, uh, I now have the, the upper hand on Bishop Joe in that I know actually what the motion uh, is looking at. Uh, I get to second the motion from a position that we've had uh, that feedback and we now know what's forming it. From the feedback we just had, it sounds like it wasn't only my group that had an encouraging and engaging discussion. Uh, lots of feedback, lots of points uh, that we now need to go away and take on board. This motion brings the Church in Wales in line with other public sector bodies, universities, businesses uh, and other institutions around Wales uh, in publishing a roadmap to becoming a net zero carbon emitter by 2030. It's a journey I'm sure many of us, uh, especially in the laity, uh, are engaged in in our day-to-day -day jobs, uh, as I am, uh, and it's really encouraging to see the Church in Wales uh, publishing this framework and joining that net zero journey that so many are on. As the report details, uh, the journey is not a quick or easy one. It will require creative and imaginative thinking. It will require collaboration among churches and dioceses, uh, and it will uh, require experience and expertise from outside the Church in Wales. The wording of this motion, I think, is key that we are embracing this framework. We're not just simply accepting it. This will require uh, some hard graft at all levels of the Church in Wales, from the representative body down to our congregations. It's needed at every level of the Church in Wales. So we need to go from this room passionately embracing uh, this framework. There's engagement needed, uh, as I said, at all levels. But I, as many of you may have done in our group, we were quick to think of people in our congregations for whom they're already living and breathing this, who are subject matter experts we can go to, who are raring to go. I encourage you to empower these people. There are challenges. I think we've seen that in our groups. But the journey is one we need to take, and this motion is the first step in that. I hope to see this framework back at governing bodies in coming years as we review and as we see how we're going. With that in mind, it's my delight to second this motion. Thank you, Dan, very much. Uh, now, as a formal motion, uh, naturally, we have to allow uh, a debate if there is anything to be said that hasn't already been said, and as Dan has pointed out, uh, and, and um, as Julia said, everything that you have contributed has already been uh, coll collected and will be collated. Um, of course, I am utterly impartial as the chair. Uh, you will note that I'm wearing green, set off with maybe a little organic aubergine, but um, that's... Uh, uh, so, does anybody have any other points they wish to make before we move to our vote? Ian, to come to the, uh, the lectern, please. I won't take too long, but uh, Your Grace, Chair, Governing Body, Ian Hibble, uh, Lander, Flay elected. Um, I very much wholeheartedly support the framework. It's great to hear that it's got the action plan that's going to be dynamic as well, that it will move and change. But I want us to look beyond the practical responses that are within those action plans, to take a step back from a policy perspective and consider who we actually bank with as churches. The Share Action Charity, which is a charity which is held to account by member organisations such as Christian Aid and CAFOD, have outlined that one of the high street banks that a lot of us actually bank with poured over $111 billion 
into um, uh, fossil fuels between 2016 and 2020, and specifically providing $59 billion um, into oil and gas expanders. They also, that bank was also investing in deforestation of our planet. Now, I welcome the mitigations that we have within this action plan, but these can all be undone if we're sleepwalking and we are in danger of offsetting our offset by who we actually bank with. We need to consider this. There is an element within this action plan around procurement. It talks about sustainable providers. I think that needs to be enhanced and strengthened. Um, we, not, we don't need to be investing or, or banking with those banks that are investing in fossil fuels and other unethical practices. If we are truly to transform and treasure from a missional perspective, who we bank with needs to be included, I think, within this framework. Um, to, to get to where we can truly say that we're reaching net zero. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. Again, only, only a quick observation. Uh, Grace Chair, members of the governing body, Stephen Bunton elected, Swansea and Brecon. Uh, just to say that somebody mentioned about corporate uh, buying schemes and the, with the Church of England, there is a parish buying scheme where people can buy into bulk bought energy um, that uh, is green energy. So that already exists. If you just go to parish buy-in, uh, you can get that information and sign into that. That's all. Thank you very much, Steve. We seem to be uh, content. Oh, here, here, uh, one more. Thank you. Anybody who wishes to speak, uh, and it's at the cost of your coffee, don't forget, uh, please come straight away to the, uh, uh, the lectern so that we can use our time effectively. Please Miriam Beecroft, Beecroft, Bangor Diocese. We've been talking about ruthless rationalisation of buildings, but we're not very good at being ruthlessly rational about our meetings because... When we meet on Zoom for Governing Body, we vote electronically, and then we have a lovely time in Newport and Cardiff. I've had a genuinely lovely time, but we're voting with pieces of paper. What, why have we gone back to voting with paper and having absolutely shed loads of paper on the tables and traveling on coaches between different places when we could have done all of this business on Zoom? Thank I think you. we need to restructure um, our, our patterns of meetings, the regularity of our meetings in person and electronically, because it doesn't look like we've changed anything. We've just gone back to meeting how we used to meet before the pandemic. Thank you. Hannah Wilkinson, St David's. Um, whilst I thoroughly support the motion and I see that environmental issues are a very important thing to do. I really don't want people to be distracted from the key role of the church, which is to make disciples and tell the good news about Jesus. And I appreciate that we can use environmental issues to engage people with the church and to encourage them, but, but we don't want people to be completely overwhelmed and distracted, please. Thank you. Adrian Morgan, co-opted, Swansea and Brecon, Archbishop, members of the governing body. Um, two points from me. I have raised this in the past. Many employers off offer access to the cycle to work scheme, allowing employees to benefit from um, incentives that allow them to pay for a, a bike over a period of time. I seem to remember that there were some complexities that didn't allow clergy to do that but could it be investigated further and possibly implemented? Secondly, I know that some uh, employee, employers offer um, the opportunity for their employees to um, pay for uh, cars, uh, sort of uh, car payments on a monthly basis, um, which are paid for before tax and national insurance and they incentivize electric vehicles. Could that be explored and potentially implemented? I'm mindful that in lots of areas across the province, clergy are traveling vast distances to hold services in lots of churches, and that could have a very detrimental impact on the environment 
if we don't look at ways of mitigating it. Diolch, thank you. Diolch and Fawr, Adrian. My vicar will be delighted when I mention the bike scheme. Uh, thank you. Just a, a, a quick point, and that is about EV chargers and about political campaigning, which I think is required here. Um, having recently bought an EV car and tried to drive from Newport to Bangor for the bishop's consecrations uh, a little while ago, um, you can't do it in Wales because the battery life won't get you there. You have to go via England. And the reason is, is because the centre of Wales doesn't have the infrastructure for EV chargers. They aren't there at the moment, and they also don't have the infrastructure. I took it to my MP. She took it to a parliamentary select committee, and the response that came back is there is major investment needed, which has to come from government. Private industry will not do this because it's rural Wales. It's not South Wales, where they're already investing because the money's there, the people are there and in the middle of Wales, there's major investment needed. The industry said this needs leadership, it needs political leadership, and it needs investment. And so that will only happen if we put our weight behind it and say to our politicians, get on with it. Um, so EV charges are great, but they need to happen, and they'll only happen if the infrastructure is there to support them. Thank you, Thank you very much. Now, I'm not hearing any uh, seeing any further um, people coming forward, so let us proceed uh, to the vote, and the vote is on the motion in front of you, and these are both uh, taken as a, a single motion, that the governing body endorse the framework, and you've heard, you've, uh, heard the, the fact that it's, it's got to be a living document developed, and urge all levels to, of the church to embrace and adopt the framework to enable us to realise our net zero carbon ambitions. So could I invite everybody to now vote, please? All those in favour? Thank you very much. Anyone against? And any abstentions? There are none. So that is a unanimous vote. Thank you so much. Bishop Joe, could I invite you to simply, uh, as you asked, lead us in prayer to close this session. So we turn to the inside front page of your uh, document, the framework document that is now ours. I shall do the opening sentence in Welsh and then we'll continue in English because it's difficult to do it bilingually. O gofio ein bod wedi'n galw i o fali am gredigaeth diw, yn gyntaf godewch i ni gyd nabod gyda diolch garwch, popeth rydym wedi'n gael ganddo, ym yfyrio wedi gar ar effaith ein gweredgedau ar ein plened a sut y gallwn gynnal y greadigaeth gyfan Gydag Awenia Du. Thank you for the wonders of creation, for the particles and waves that constitute the world around us in an ever expanding universe of your love's energy and self giving. As we value its complexity, beauty, and fragility, Help us to feel more responsible for its sustainability. We say together, help, help us, us to notice, notice what, what we are doing day by day, day to make, to make things, things better, to learn from our neighbours in a global, global world, to make our footprint as light as possible, to find new solutions to old and new problems, to reduce our greed, consumption and, and dependency, dependency on fossil, fossil fuels, fuels and to, to turn wonder into practical actions. We ask in the name of Jesus, the agent of creation through whom all things were made, our redeemer and our hope. Amen. Thank you, Bishop Joe, and thank you, everybody.